Good morning or afternoon or whenever, whenever this is. Not legal advice. Let me move the microphone so it's within a couple of yards of me. Um, like, subscribe, share, comment. Again, animals generally like this, especially dogs, cats, and goldfish. So please show it to them. Um, I wanted to talk today a little bit about uh, GTI Alpine Atlas trading, a little bit of finger motion, and capybara. Um, in that order, uh, I'll try to make them brief before we begin. Uh, not legal advice. Don't uh, rely upon this. Use this to derive some ideas. Do your own due diligence. Check with somebody you trust. Uh, I got a, a wig today for a buck. Can you imagine that? It was a low price to pay. Uh, and by the way, when I give lawyer jokes, I, you know, not all lawyers are, are difficult. Some are very nice. So I just don't take them. These are jokes. So take them as such, notwithstanding whatever your opinions are about lawyers. So what's the difference between a vacuum cleaner and a lawyer riding a motorcycle? The vacuum cleaner has the dirt bag on the inside. An alligator makes a good lawyer because he is an efficient litigator. And last but not least, and before I start this one, remember that some people think lawyers are dicks. So with that in mind, what does a lawyer get when you give him Viagra? Taller. Okay, let's move on. So First with Alpine. So Alpine is involved in multiple legal proceedings. Uh, one in Utah. Utah was an action against the NSCC, DTCC. It was with regard to Alpine getting into trouble with their capital requirements deemed to be too big a risk per the rules that they were aware of and consented to and knew the outcome. They were required to uh, add more money as security. It was a $10 million. They weren't the only one that was asked, by the way. Apparently, there were 150 firms that were asked to do such. Alpine was the only one that had difficulties doing it. That might tell you something. And uh, notwithstanding that, in addition, they were accused of misrepresenting the fact that they did have those monies when they didn't. In essence, what they were doing apparently was borrowing or had an option to borrow, and they said that's money, and it wasn't. So they got into trouble with that. Uh, they tried to block a disciplinary proceeding when they were going to be thrown out of the DTCC, which would make it difficult for them to do business, of course, unless they were self-clearing. Um, so they lost the injunction. And what's interesting is apparently on March 18th, the disciplinary hearing before the DTCC, NCCC, and whoever else, CC, uh, took place. And... It started on the 18th. I presume it's concluded. It's confidential. We haven't gotten the ruling, but apparently it went forward because they didn't seek a stay like they did in the case in D.C. Why didn't they seek a stay? Perhaps they don't have the money to pay. Perhaps they are going out of business. Perhaps they thought they'd lose. I don't know, but they didn't seek the stay, which is interesting. And that was at a uh, and, and I think it's interesting, and I'll get to it later, why it's interesting, especially in light of the D.C. case, and I'll tie it together. Um, but it's interesting they didn't pursue it. What will the result be in the disciplinary proceeding? I think because they're accused of lying, it's likely they're going to get bounced um, out of there. So without that, it'd be difficult for them to do business. Again, I don't know who's paying legal fees or why uh, they're paying legal fees when they're probably spending more than Alpine's bringing in, in my opinion. That's my opinion. I know others might have different opinions. But anyway, so that's the Utah action. That's the disciplinary action in Utah. It's ongoing. Uh, if, if Alpine gets bounced out of that, they can appeal to the SEC and they could take it to the Court of Appeal. But um, at some point in time, it's going to be the law of diminishing returns because there's no there's no, if they lie about their capital structure, it's going to be difficult for them to ever uh, properly de-risk that. But anyway, that's what's going on in there. So Perry disciplinary proceeding, proceeding, we'll find out what happened 
soon, probably within 30 days. Before I go on to the DC appeal about Alpine, I wanted to briefly talk about Atlas Trading. I know that uh, the case against several of the Atlas Trading Group were tossed, and I think it was because there was no proof of intent to defraud. And everybody reacted favorably about that. I kind of wanted to put a little, uh, uh, little stop, a little hesitancy to that conclusion. Just because the SEC was not successful doesn't mean that it's good for retail. And just take into account that savvy management and mints were part of, or apparently part of the same Atlas trading group. And savvy management is charged with naked shorting uh, for a substantial period of time in which they generated substantial monies. So if savvy management, naked shorted, and they're part of this Atlas trading group, which apparently that's what I read, then I don't feel so good that the SEC uh, let the Atlas trading people go. Now, I don't know the facts, so maybe it was a bad case, very possible, uh, but I don't know. But I'm suspect that savvy management is part of that group. But separate and apart from that, so let's say somebody doesn't have intent to fraud, and let's say Joe is a member, and I, I don't know Joe. If Joe is a member of, of this group and he's pushing a stock, but he really doesn't know if it's good or bad, so he's negligent at best or maybe reckless, and you hear him and he's got credibility and he says, you know, I think this stock's going to be great and you buy it. So is that okay? Should, should that be excused? Uh, Cause that wouldn't record, that wouldn't have any intent to fraud. That would just be negligent or reckless and you relied upon it and tough luck. So I'm not so quick to dismiss uh, the fact that these guys got off. That doesn't give me any sense of a uh, calm. It doesn't mean to me they're good guys. I don't know them either way. And again, with savvy management apparently being part of that group, that causes me concern. Perhaps that's untrue what I read. If savvy management is not part of the Atlas trading clan, then so be it. But as I said, they could act recklessly or negligently and still harm people without intent. So that's those are my words about Atlas trading. Alpine, DC Appeal. I think I mentioned this before. Now, now since I've seen the briefs, I can talk about it. So uh, the court in the appeal, and the appeal is of the denial of the injunction stopping another disciplinary proceeding against Alpine brought by FINRA based upon their repeated violation of a cease and desist order that was entered against them in 2023, early 2023 excuse me, early 2022. Um, and following that, there were a bunch of legal proceedings and legal maneuvers. Uh, there was an uh, uh, injunction request to stop the expedited expulsion proceeding at the district court federal level. That was denied. It went up on appeal. The appellate court said it was okay. As to the injunction, just kind of stopping things. And then there was an, the actual hearing on the appeal that's ongoing Briefs were, hot, were filed. There was oral argument. The court earlier this month asked for supplemental briefs on a particular issue involving a statute, Section 15 USC, Section 780B8. And what that section says basically is that the SEC commissioner can exempt a party, including a broker, from the requirements of being a member of uh, FINRA, for example. So the court asked both parties to brief the issue simultaneously, which was on the 22nd, uh, the very afternoon, I think it was at 4 p.m. on the 22nd, and asked them to brief the issue and tell them, does this apply? How does it apply? And et cetera. Both parties, so the FINRA filed the brief, the, uh, the U.S. filed a brief in support of FINRA, so it was two, and Alpine filed a brief. Alpine's brief was, this doesn't apply and they very sparingly exempt entities. They did, they did say they did exempt entities, but very sparingly. The other uh, briefs from uh, FINRA and the government basically said, I don't think this really changes our position and our ability to succeed, but there are exemptions that are provided and so be it. And those are the 
basically a summary of those two briefs. So it really was strong that Alpine's counsel really didn't think it applied and really didn't think it was relevant. And what's the relevancy of that? The question the court during oral argument uh, was checking on was whether if Alpine's was expelled, would they be able to do business? Would they be kicked out of the business? That was during oral argument. Subsequent to the oral argument, the court asked about this particular section. This particular section would give the SEC commissioner permission, if circumstances were correct, to let Alpine not be a member of FINRA. Now, Alpine in their brief uh, ex expressed skepticism whether that would occur, but it seems like it's a possibility. And for the appellate court, the way I'm interpreting it, if that's a possibility that even if Alpine got kicked out, they would have some opportunity to do business. And since they would have some opportunity to do business, therefore, I'm more inclined, now I'm speaking for the appellate court, to side with FINRA and the government against Alpine. That's the way I'm reading it, and that's the, the way I'm reading the way the, the um, briefs were filed. And um, so that's interesting to me, and I wonder how that ties in or if it ties in with Alpine's election not to seek a stay in Utah. Maybe because of this issue in the D.C. appeal, they thought it was a waste to pursue a stay in Utah because the court in D.C. is inclined to rule against them. Now, that's my interpretation from what I've read in terms of the oral argument, which I saw, the briefs, and these new briefs. Again, who's paying the legal fees? Is it John Hurry? Is it illegal interest? Remember, there was violations of the Bank Secrecy Act, which was set up to prevent money laundering, etc. So I, that's what wonder me, wonders makes me wonder the most is who's financing the legal fees and why. So that's what's going on with Alpine. Briefs were filed on 22nd. I think supplemental briefs are filed within a week. Then the court will have all the briefs, I think, at once. And then, although it's taking longer as usual, there'll be a uh, ruling, and I would guess a ruling within 60 days of the last brief. Last brief if it's March 31st, then there'll be a final, final ruling on or before May 31st. I would expect it earlier, but at latest May 31st. So that's, that's the Alpine update relating to the briefs involving the section about whether the SEC can, ex can give an exemption to Alpine to be excluded from FINRA. Again, I don't think that's in Alpine's favor. I think it's in FINRA's and the government's favor. Okay, now we're gonna move to part two. Part two is continued ongoing dealings with GTII. And a, a reminder, I started before, and, and so this, we talked about the, the first part is Alpine. And Alpine is, is uh, relevant because some people believe if they're out, that will encourage activity with regard to the GTII stock on, at, at, and will cause it to uh, react favorably. So that's what all the procedural stuff about Alpine and where it is. Now I'm talking about dealings with GTII. And I've did, a, did at least one or two about this already. And remember, I started uh, February, before February 6th, contacting the company. I reached out to GTII because I was concerned about they had not consummated the transaction. I was aware that people thought that if uh, the Alpine procedural stuff came forward, that Alpine would get kicked out, that would cause a short squeeze, et cetera. But I was more interested in the transactional side because I believe since GTII had limited if any income, that a transaction that they engaged in, especially an acquisition of a material nature, would positively positively impact the stock. So I started prior to February 6th to check it out, reached out to them, spoke to various people, got contacted by various people, and eventually, and I, I think I said March 6th, but it's actually March 3rd, so just to be accurate, March 3rd, I get a letter from... Fatel Legal PLC, 
And I've talked about it before, but I'll just read the parts that are most important. It's a fairly short letter anyway, short, um, but I'll read it. The first part says that we are counsel to Global Tech Industries Group, Inc., OTC GTII, and are writing in response to your letter to GTII dated February 6, 2024. So I'd send a letter out four weeks prior to this. And now I'm going to cut to this part. And, you know, they're responding because I'm, I said, uh, you know, what are you guys doing? I'm questioning if you guys are going to close the transaction, et cetera. That's what triggered this responsive letter. It was sent. Uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern time on a Sunday night, I think because I was I indicated I was going to take action if I didn't hear from them. And so apparently he was hired to do this, although he indicated earlier at some other point in time, he was hired, I think, middle of January of this year uh, to handle this stuff. So now reading again from this letter. It says, understandably, it is the best interest of all shareholders that GTI complete a fruitful transaction. Furthermore, GTII is working towards closing its outstanding acquisition target as soon as possible. As you can understand, the acquisition target is a separate legal entity not yet controlled by GTII. We ask that you await GTII's upcoming 10K annual report for important details that will be made available to all shareholders. Thank you for your patience. Sincerely, Jack Vettel. So I've had, so I got that. Uh, at the same time I'm hearing, I get, I've had communications with various people. I've heard about various deals. Most of them have been public. Uh, I think there was discussion about Trent. I think all this public because I've heard it publicly. Trento and anything that's been provided to me has not been provided in confidence. So I think I could talk about anything. That's kind of why I'm doing this. Um, I was, I think I was, I was contacted about the Trento deal. I think I was, I heard about the AI deal. I think I heard about a water deal. Um, and I heard about from various people that GTII was, and this is what I heard because I hadn't heard or never spoken directly to the CEO uh, who is a uh, elderly gentleman who resides, I think, out here in California. I've never heard from him, never spoken to any of the uh, principals, nobody. But from multiple people involving aspects of those deals, I've gotten the same message that management hasn't done what they need to do to complete these deals, haven't undertaken the necessary due, due diligence. Maybe they're not inclined to do a transaction. And I wondered about that. You know, why wouldn't they want to do a transaction? You know, are they not interested in uh, working towards the benefit of shareholders at possibility? Are they in retirement mode and they're living a, a nice lifestyle out here in California, living off their shares and that's sufficient? Are they just pre pretending to do things? Anyway, since I had heard word and heard that none of those transactions had been closed or were uh, close to being closed, uh, it concerned me. So had numerous conversations with counsel for GTII, Mr. Fattel, uh, not such numerous conversations, several, but many, many communications by email. And that's since my last uh, uh, communication with you about this deal. And they constantly have indicated that they're working on it, they're acting in good faith, uh, that my view is wrong, uh, that my my view of the management not doing what they're try trying to do is uh, perhaps incorrect. I dis I disclosed him, you know, and I've been tried to been direct. One I've been that I've been public about it. I know they're watching my videos because they've talked. Mr. Fattel told me that about that they are watching my videos. So good afternoon. And um, he's indicated that they're working hard to close a transaction. He said, wait till the 10K comes out. He's promised it's not going to come out later than March 31st. And it will provide important details, as the letter said. And he's said that personally, too. So that concerned me when I hear from a bunch of other people either involved with transactions or have been involved with management who possess a different opinion, that they're wondering if they really are inclined to do a deal. So I've communicated that to Mr. Fattel also. And we've had our 
communications have kind of gr grown strained or more strained over time. I've indicated that I'd give them to after 10K, but if they, in the 10K, if it reflects what I see as dead transactions, in other words, transactions that maybe could have been closed months ago, but are no longer because of the way GTI or management handled them. If they throw out in the 10K, it's a dead transaction. I specifically referenced the deals that I just referenced. Uh, I said, that's not going to be good for management. And I indicated that I would, not only would I pursue them, but others have told me that they would pursue them. So, and that would be for the benefit of GTII, in my opinion, because either way, and I've, this is the way I've seen it all along. That's why I've disclosed it one way or the other. If a transaction occurs, a fruitful transaction, even as Mr. Fattel said, that would certainly benefit shareholders. I believe a fruitful transaction can be closed. I mean, somebody contacted me and said they could close the deal now, one of those parties. And I don't think even GTI is even working with them. Um, and I don't know because I didn't study the deal. Maybe it's not true. But they said they could and they said they would reach out. But I'm wondering about uh, the um, integrity of GTI's management. That's my, my wonderment and my opinion. So I've reflected to a counsel for, for GTI, and I've told them basically that if this is BS, they're going to get sued. And so the way I see it is either transaction is going to get done, it's going to benefit all of us, and management should get out, or management should get out. Either way, new management, I think, will be able to consummate a transaction because I think they're there to be done. Um, they need more vibrant management, not uh, a super elderly population. I don't think they're up to the task of doing what needs to be. So here we go. I'm waiting till the 10K comes out. It'll be out for before March 31st. Perhaps I will be surprised and it will reflect a new transaction that's set to close or perhaps prior to that, prior to March 31st, they know about some other deal that's going to close and I don't know about it. Perhaps they have other ideas. I don't know. All I can say is based upon what they've said in their letter, what I've, what's been communicated to me and what other people have told me. So kind of a dichotomy, what I hear from management's counsel. And I have to be honest, he's only been around since January. So perhaps some of the stuff he's not personally familiar with, and perhaps management's not telling him the whole story, perhaps. But from what I hear, it'll be interesting. The 10K on the 31st will be interesting. And one way or the other, I think GTII is going to get to a good place, whether it would be existing management or or new management. So that's that's it. And I'm uh, I and I don't focus on the short squeeze aspect. I'm short, focusing more on the transactional aspect. Although who knows what could happen in a in a squeeze? And now since Alpine's procedural status is in question, we don't know about that. Now, last but not least, I want to talk briefly about. Capybara and uh, Mark Bazile got a default judgment against Capybara in the um, finger motion matter. So, and that's because they didn't they didn't appear. I think they appeared at one hearing, and the gentleman Igor from Young Frankenstein, I think he um, kind of lost it. And a default judgment was entered. And in another case involving shot or short, I don't remember which the name of the company was, shot or short, maybe it's, maybe I'm, I've short on the brain. A default judgment was ent entered against um, Capybara also for another fake shortened report. I think they did one on Soundhound also. Soundhound is uh, owned partially by NVIDIA. It may not be a good choice by uh, Capybara also. But after the default judgment against shot or short, whatever the name of the company is, uh, Benzinga retracted their report. And I, on behalf of Busy Brands, when the original Capybara short report on finger motion came out, which seemed to be false and did cause harm to Capybara and a lot of shareholders, I uh, served a letter, a cease and desist letter on Benzinga and TD Ameritrade, I believe, and asked that they retract their the uh, story. They refused. After they retracted the shot or short uh, one on the company, shot or short, 
I, on Friday, I think it was Friday or Thursday, I sent a new letter out to Ben Zinga, or I call him Mr. Ben Zinga, and TD Ameritrade, indicating that um, based upon what you just did and based upon Campabera's uh, principal who's making these short and distort reports is a donkey. I was being nice. Uh, and since you just retracted the one in the other case, retract the one regarding busy brands and issue up an apology and pay damages. That was sent on for Thursday and Friday. I think I gave them to Monday or Tuesday to respond. We'll see if we get a response. And then we'll see if they don't retract under similar circumstances then we'll have to consider if we're going to file an action because if these entities are filing false reports, false information about individuals that impact stock and our share, share values and they refuse to retract them and continue to print garbage, then that's not justified and we'll have to enforce that. So I will keep you advised about that and what their res response is. Or Busy Brands will do it. I love that name, by the way. Anyway, so we talked about Alpine in Utah and D.C. and the procedural aspects and where they are. We talked about a little bit about Atlas, Atlas Trading and Savvy Management and Mints and how are they connected to that and whether reckless or negligent conduct is helpful. Talked about my ongoing dealings with GTII, waiting for the 10K. I've heard from people that have been inconsistent with what I've heard from the attorney for GTII. I read the letter to you, or at least portions of that, and we will know on or before March 31st, because they said the 10K would come out before that, and they've reaffirmed that. And they haven't changed, by the way, anything they've said in terms of how they're working and the target, et cetera. So we, we shall see. And again, I've told them also that if it's BS, then they'll be pursued and we'll get rid of management, get new management in and that can do a deal. That's kind of, I've been open and uh, direct with them. And then we talked about Capybara and why, about the retraction, why they should retract the busy band, brand, the comment about busy brand and that nonsense. They should issue an apology and damages. Uh, so that's it for today. If you have questions, comments about anything, even about the jokes, please let me know. And I will, I always look at the comments and I always, you'll know that I looked at it. You will see that I looked at it because you'll get a, some indication and uh, ask questions. Anyway, be well. I know it's a long one. Be well, take care. Everybody have a great day. See you soon.